Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Good day and welcome back to another episode of the Forty Orty Podcast with your host, of course, Mr. Thomas Henley. Today we're going to be talking about something that I haven't really touched on before. We're going to be talking about ableism and more specifically ableism in the workplace. You know, what it looks like, uh, the sort of difficulties that you can have in different um, workplace settings, some of the good things, some of the bad things, as well as how we can band together to try and reduce the amount of ableism that's out there. So today I've, I'm joined by my very lovely guest, Lydia from the account Journal Lydia. Hi, you, thank you for having me. How are you doing today? All good. Uh, thank you for having me on. Um, <laughs> I will say this is not what I usually sound like. Um, I, everyone I know seems to have this hideous cold that's going around. Um, oh, so yeah. I'm very sorry about that. It happens. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Lydia, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do in the world of work and what you do on Instagram? <laughs> what do I do on Instagram? Um, mainly mess around, it seems to me. Um, by trade, I'm a freelance journalist, and that means that um, I write for national and re- and kind of like regional publications. So, um. My work has appeared in places like The Metro, Refinery29, Possibility Magazine. Um, did I say The Independent? Places like that. Um, this generally revolves around kind of like disability and social justice issues. So um, it can, in the early stages of the pandemic, for example, I was looking a lot at people who were shielding, um, particularly those who were it was very strange to me the fact that the way in which people who were shielding were covered in that that it was always just assumed that they were like you know over the age of 65 70 when it was all ages and yet there was just basically no coverage of that at the time um am i right in thinking that shielding is like it's it's when you try and protect a certain group from getting infected or is that right yeah, but the thing about that is it always sort of, it was always kind of always put in a way where it was like, oh, this person is elderly and this group is always just, yeah. it's the old age pension is kind of thing, um, which is beyond inaccurate and also quite harmful. Um, so there were people that I knew at the time who were shielding, who um, people would come up to them and say things like, oh, you're too young to be getting the COVID vaccine, you can't be a shielder even if they had quite serious conditions and that kind of thing. Um, it's I also produce the Conscious Being podcast. Um, Conscious Being is a magazine that I write for. I've been a, what you might call a staff writer for a while. Um, with, enough, with enough since the inception of the magazine, I think, something like that. Um, it's And I also seem to write books, possibly, um, plural to be decided. Wow. So you love words. <laughs> um yeah it's uh I've always sort of wondered whether I'm not diagnosed as hyperlexic but I think I had hyperlexic tendencies as a child to be honest I I found that so I I never I never really followed it up I think uh, at one point I was um I I applied for the the BBC journalism apprenticeship thingy mm-hmm. and I got I got through to the final stage but due to the the pandemic um they cancelled it so i got, so, I got well, through right it's, i applied as well and it was really did you get the email where it was like we would tell you in three days time whether you've got through it and then it was like six months later and it was like oh sorry we forgot about you um by the way this is cancelled yeah. bye we're not doing anything with this <laughs> yeah. that um, was really frustrating yeah it was it wasn't very helpful to be honest because it was kind of like 
you know, when when you sort of you're trying to make some of something of yourself long term, you, you think very far into the future and you're like you set yourself on an objective and then you go for it and then you know something happens that's completely out of your control so it kind of mm, i kind of feel that that's that. we've had to learn that with the pandemic to be honest um mm. i'm saying this uh, as an autistic person i find it quite difficult to deal with change for example that being said i find it quite strange with the kind of like the opening up of the pandemic and sort of people are like, oh, we can make future plans. Um, and my brain is in that mode still sort of like, hmm, we're still in the pandemic. Could there be something that could change drastically soon? Why are we planning ahead this far type thing? It's, it's, it's always very strange because I hear about um, people talking about things like executive functioning and planning and, things of that nature but because we're sort of in this big neurodiverse community and there's so much crossover between autism and ADHD for example um it can be sometimes quite hard to give advice around planning <laughs> because yeah they, they may they may have a diagnosis of autism but may also be ADHD and they kind of need a happy medium between the two to you know you know what you're saying earlier about um hyperlexia like I, I definitely found that when I was, when I was younger, like I, I could read very, very, a very, very young age. When I started school, um, I, my academic performance and my reading and writing and maths and stuff went down until I picked up, um, a game called Yu-Gi-Oh! It's based on like an anime series, but it's basically a card game where you have like monsters that have attack and defense and you have to try and hit people's life points. And one of the the great things about Yu-Gi-Oh is that it had the um, the mathematical reading, writing, and sort of logical comprehension stuff built into it. But a lot of my academic work was done playing Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if it works for you, I mean, it's just, I kind of feel like if we just adapt it a bit more, if it works for you, then that's okay. Surely you're still learning. I find um, the whole concept of, of ableism quite, quite interesting because, you know, on the surface, ableism is just, you know, as, as the definition would lead you into, it's the discrimination of a set of disabled people in favor of able bodied people. Am I right? But the, the, the issue that I find that it is really hard for me to conceptualize exactly what are the sort of downstream ableist like behaviors, because it seems to be something that is very individual. Mm. Um, you know, it makes sense, especially with autism, you have different traits. Obviously, it's going to be a bit more individual. I guess, you know, how, how would you describe ableism towards autistic people in sort of a oh, practical setting. Um, how do you hope you like to to bubble it? <laughs> um, for this, I can only talk from my own personal experience. Um, sure. I just want to caveat this in in case of like people listening and they come back and they say that's not my experience at all. Um, sure. in in terms of my workplace, um, I. It's so interesting that you use the word behaviour. So I've been thinking about this a lot recently. I sometimes think that ableism can present in terms of kind of like other isms, if that makes sense. So mm. um, I'm trying to think of a way to describe this like without... Racism, I think, sexism. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I'm trying to think of a way to describe this without identifying this person too much because this would get me in a lot of trouble if they did. Recently, there was some. There was somebody that I used to work with, and they were fully aware that I was on the spectrum. I would describe the kind of the working relationship as sort of like having this weaponized against me, in the sense of oh, she's so vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm only vulnerable when you start to question, uh, like, to question my ability to do my job, or you start to like. It's the stereotype of kind of like oh, she's female, therefore we, she, the, the big scary man must walk alongside <laughs> her type thing um, yeah. to walk her home type thing. Um, they, what I understand is, even though I haven't spoken to this person in over a year, they, they, 
they really do not matter. Um, I don't work with them anymore. Um, they were still going on and on and on about me working for them in the kind of like, I would describe it as being quite sort of misogynistic, really. Um, sure. That, I think, can interplay with ableism in the sense that if I had been a guy and if I had not been on the spectrum, that would have not happened at all. It defined sure. the it defined the behaviour of the way that they were acting in a way. Um I don't know, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. Um it's Well it's way. it's it's kind of leading into, you know, I the first official question that I said <laughs> from the question list that I sent you, which is, you know, what what experiences of ableism have you found in the workplace? Um, Several. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel it's sort of like um, it's sort of like every possible presumption that people have. So um, I'm very aware of the fact that I can walk and that I can talk and I have this um, what you could call privilege in that sense. I'm just very aware that there are other autistic people who can't walk and they can't talk and they can't do X, Y, Z. The thing about this is um, people have a very sort of quite specific mm. idea, kind of in like Rain Man terms, mm. of sort of like what autism may or may not be. Rain Man mm. is not actually based on an autistic person. The person it's actually based on was actually misdiagnosed. Um, it's just sort of become sort of this cultural sort of motif almost. I don't know what you would call this. So whenever I've gone into the workplace and because of the fact that I, I legally have to say, hi, I'm autistic, I need reasonable adjustments, such as in an interview, all that sort of thing. Generally speaking, no one believes me. Even in the, it's I have a wonderful co-writer I'm working with on a project currently. I've been a massive fan of this person, uh, another journalist um, from Times Newspapers ever since I was about, probably 14 I'm 23 now they initially I don't think they actually believed me when um I had to say I'm on the spectrum and I currently don't understand you and frankly your eye contact is weirding me out can you like look away sort of thing so this is kind of like um I can't remember, I can't remember the exact word for it but you're sort of overwriting someone's experiences invalidating um, based, based, invalidating yeah based on what you think about someone that you just met? <laughs> I also think it's um, there's indirect and directly um, in terms of the application of discrimination. Um, mm -hmm. So in some places that I've worked, um, again, not naming names, uh, the wonderful, this seems to keep recurring. I don't know why. Um, people keep saying things like, just communicate better. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can tell by the look on your face it's just yeah. it's still completely bonkers isn't it just to sort of say oh just communicate better i don't know why don't i just wave my magic wand and i'll just stop being autistic just for a moment i would say it's i was told after uh the last time that happened that's actually microaggression yeah the thing about this is newsrooms are also not a nice place um I know that we should. I should be saying, come and be a reporter, come and work in my industry. I would be a hypocrite if I was saying that. Um, I don't work in, for, I freelance, I work from home for this particular reason. Newsrooms are not nice places. It's I've always been pigeonholed. Um, I've had to deal with abuse. I've had to deal with editors um, doing the whole sort of, oh, she's autistic. Why don't we just hire her for brownie points? Yeah, it's. I've only ever had maybe two job interviews where um, the reasonable adjustments have actually been in place. Really? Yep. Um. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, this kind of it kind of brings brings me to something that um, I think is you know a really big issue in the the world of work at the moment is we have a lot of push for diversity in the workplace, like for. Mm -hmm getting getting autistic people into the workplace but they don't actually put any of the the time and the effort and the things in place in yeah. order to get the best out of the individual and yes yeah. you know especially like in um places like like the media um it's it's you know we're, inherently we are at a disadvantage in in the working world because 
a large part of getting places is about being socially intelligent and yeah. <laughs> like about being assertive and about I, th- I think the best way to, to put it is you know you, c- you can get lots of places by just being good at socializing and having a big ego yeah. that and, is um, <laughs> loving the big ego that is so <laughs> that is so the way that I would describe my profession um it's, um, it's not based would... on, on merit or anything it's it's exactly. some some people some people they just go in and they, they they're just a talking head and they just talk 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 and then somehow they just make their way up the ladder um <laughs> find themselves in positions of power and and just having absolutely no clue about what to do with it exactly i love i love the fact that you've used the phrase big ego it's um prior to um logging on to record this podcast um i was talking to um <laughs> I really hope she listens to this because I can just imagine her laughing. Um, there's a BBC journalist um, who she is my best friend um, and she would describe me as being that. Um, she has the nickname Auntie, um, but there is a particular person that we both know who she would describe as being exactly that, the big ego. Yes. Um, yeah. And prior to logging on, we were compla- we were complaining over WhatsApp, going, "Why are there so many egos in this industry? Like, why do we have to deal with them? Like, there's no merit to it." And just sort of like it's always like a sort of like like um you know the phrase peacock fight, where there's a sort yes. of <laughs> yeah, the sort yeah. of push, pushing the chest out, sort of um... yeah, you're showing the feather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's- it it is it is really true. I mean, I think you know, consider considering that it kind of makes the the whole working landscape quite difficult, or just like, well, as you would say, indirectly discriminatory yeah. um, against people. I suppose an idea, sort of a concept that really springs to mind when I think about indirect discrimination is the way that we pay people for work it's um it's very very hours based yeah and from my experience autistic people we work we work very fast and we work very specific and good and high quality um and we do we do a lot more in those hours that that we have but the the other hours that we have we we find it very difficult and it, it eats into a lot of our energy sort of me- ability to perform mental energy and then we have burnouts you know, if if organisations, I guess, would have more of a um, an approach of workload for pay, then it would remove a lot of that. But it's not like that. And you know, for example, myself, I would like, I would love to to work full time. Um, I, I work basically full time, about four days a week. But even even then, it's you know, all of my pay is dictated by how often I'm working and that's that's not something specific to my organization it's specific to a lot of workplaces yeah what what, what do you a, think about that <laughs> um it's so interesting it's so interesting that you've mentioned this it's i've noticed that the i forget where this is um it's somewhere in the uk but there are a lot of people who are doing a particular style of working week in that to see if that actually works and time after time, it's shown in terms of like productivity, productivity improves if you have the workload rather than the yeah. hour per pay type thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, I also feel that this would, in terms of kind of like commercial issues related to newspapers, this could potentially solve a lot. Um, I kind of feel my industry gets a lot of criticism if we get stuff wrong. The thing so- is, we're, we are underfunded. Newsrooms are dying. Everyone knows that print is on its way out. So mistakes are made. We are human. Um, robots don't write the news yet, thankfully. I suppose, I suppose um, that's 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 the issue because it's like um, it's you, you're an outward facing profession. Like you're not you're not inward facing. You don't like. Well, I'm sure there will be some aspects to it, but most most of the stuff that you publish and put out is for the world to see or for anybody who who comes across the website or the blog or you know things like that um and true um i feel it's a little bit more complex only because in terms of like um 
scandals and related things. Um, but in terms of the in terms of the working for pay thing, I kind of feel that in terms of if people just worked for their workload versus the actual hours, um, in terms of kind of like commercial costs and like making a profit for newspapers, it would solve so much. Um, yeah. Rather than sort of like um, every year, it's um, if it's like something like the Circulation Bureau or something, I can't remember what, um, everyone's always like, oh, look, um, such and such of newspapers lost this many copies this year and lost this amount of profit and therefore they must cut numbers. Well, if you worked a bit smarter rather than working like around the clock type thing and actually adapting to how news evolves rather than sort of expecting the kind of like pay per hour thing, I feel it would be quite innovative. Mm-hmm. I'm glad, I'm glad to, glad to hear that you think it's a good idea as well. <laughs> Cause um... more inclusive. if you want a diverse media, you need inclusion practices. Yeah. It's, I, th- I think another another thing that I think could really do with a lot of work is positive, reasonable adjustments. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I was talking to oh, what's her name? I was talking to what, uh, someone else on a, on a previous episode about reason, reasonable adjustments in the workplace, and the issue. I think the issue at the moment is that it's a very deficit based model. So it's yeah. meant to, it's meant to to pull up your deficits these reasonable adjustments, like the support that you get is for the things that you can't do. Whereas if you wanted to get the best out of the individual, you would sort of craft a, a role for, for a person, take out the bits that the rubbish, rubbish at, give them to some people and then keep all the stuff that they're really good at and get them to just, just work at that. And like, it's a bit hard nowadays because you have job titles and you have specific roles which are laid down on paper and you know you could be exceptionally good at 90 90% of it but the other 10% is um stuff that you just can't for the life of you just get your head around it's like me with biology i uh, just never could get in my head about doing statistical tests and things like that <laughs> I much prefer to actually learn about how things work, um, but that that ten percent is quite large because you kind of need it to like um, to churn out and push out publications and things like that. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, I don't feel I really have anything to contribute to that. Um, I agree. Sure. Um, I don't. Do you have any other to... sort of an indirect um, discrimination examples or? It's a uh, job interviews. Um, basically, mm. um, I've never really had a, su- a successful job interview. Um, it's a uh, um pretty much whenever it's again, it's that feeling, not that feeling. I'm going to rephrase. It's that knowledge that when I've gone into an interview previously, um, I feel that this is really quite terrible practice when you have um when you play people off against each other. Like, that, that happens, like two two interviewees, or more in a group. Really? Yeah, it's. I've been in oh, several God. interviews. Um, it sounds like great. hell. But it's that thing that's just sort of like um, I've been in interviews where I've realised that there's another autistic person, and that's that thing of I know people see me as a normal person, therefore I know already that I've not got the role. Because people still see functioning labels. I'm trying to think of other examples. I should have written notes before um, I came into this. Um, it's okay. It's, it, it's also the thing about um, in terms of stories and things that I write very often that people try to pigeonhole. What's what's pigeonholing again? I've, I've heard it a lot. Um, I just can't remember exactly. Um, in the sense of here's an autistic, here's an autistic person Therefore, they must write everything about autism and nothing uh, else. Okay. Um, so, or like, if you're a, if you're a woman, you have to w- talk about women's things, and you can't talk yeah. about in general. Um, and it happens across sort of like basically e- anything that ticks other. Um, so I I know I remember being so ashamed at the time of when the um, George Floyd when mm. th- that sort of erupted. 
Um, and basic newsrooms are very white places, and they basically said, oh, we want to commission writers of an ethnic minority background to write about ethnic minority issues because we want a diverse media. Why don't you just commission them in the first place rather than going right about this super traumatic event? Like, it just sort of... It was just that throwing them in of, there. Hey, hello, here's your interview. Right, right about this horrible thing to do with your race. <laughs> yeah, but it's just sort of like... That it's things like that that are just so utterly shameful. And like, it's sort of like, really? You could, you could have just done better if you just thought about this just a little bit, just a teeny tiny bit. Um, but that is examples of pigeonholing where you just go, oh, this person, this person is different. Therefore, they must write about this difference. That's so weird to the rest of us. <laughs> no, I get that. And... um. I mean, in general, it's. I mean, for me, for me as an independent creator, it's um, it's much easier for me to talk about things that I have direct experience with, as opposed to. Um, and it's preferred. I think it's also preferred by a lot of autistic people. Like you, a lot of them don't really want neurotypicals coming in and telling them what to do and how to do it, and. <laughs> telling telling them about the experience of autism it can it could be quite difficult in that sense like it's not necessarily that it's a prerequisite for for making stuff about autism but it's definitely highly favorable to a lot of people so i can sort i can sort of see the the flip side of that but then you know it, it brings me to but it's you know, so autis autism and autism in the media in general you know like um, why why does it be that every time a, an autistic person is on the screen it's because of autism or we're talking about autism why can it not just be a sit like a series or a film or well, there are a few but where or, there's just an autistic not, person there or, why not do it if i say properly so it's all very well to say write about this super traumatic thing but in the first place you should be hiring ethnic minority mm. writers you cannot, Sorry, yeah, I see point. you cannot, as an editor or someone in a place hiring, you cannot say, we want a diverse media, and then just say, oh, out of the blue for one month and one month only, we want to write, we want these people to write for us. Mm. You should just have them anyway, and they shouldn't have to be writing about the same subject. They should sure. be allowed to choose. It's the whole uh, organisation versus the individual this kind of yeah thing like i i'm sure we'd get a lot more interesting a lot more f interesting emotional impactful uh journal articles if it wasn't so heavily dictated by by the the higher ups it's it, the the way in which we tell stories is changing but some newspapers have yet to catch up um so sure. in terms of how am i going to put this um, in terms of the formats that we tell stories, for example, if you look at the Bristol Cable, for example, they have, um, like, they incorporate um, voice notes, for example. So they have people reading out the story like you do on Substack. Um, they have interactive photos and all that kind of thing. Um, rather, and that's the thing in terms of news is 24-7, so we, there needs to be a balance. Some news, some newspapers are better at it than others. I think. And I, I guess to, you know, to some extent, it's not really something that I've um, had a lot of either professional or personal experience for. It's mostly <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's it's good to have have your insight on that because I, I just checked out the Bristol Cable thing and you know stuff like that. It's it's really awesome. It's it's not the type of content that I like to. I like I like videos. I like people voices, and <laughs> I like to hear people's opinions. I kind of feel that where traditional media is dying. This is going to be controversial. Traditional media is dying, and yet we have other organisations that are sort of taking over. Mm. Um, so like the Bristol Cable. The Bristol Cable is not a newspaper, but it's if I say different in that sense it's like a news a new site mm. <laughs> the place i usually go for news it's usually um i usually just follow n some news sites on instagram and then i just let their 
their posts come through and they usually do like quite nifty short videos or write-ups and um one 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 that i like a lot is uh vice which um i'm not too sure about the, the company itself but i i always find the articles very interesting not all of them but <laughs> <laughs> i guess you know just to kind of finish off the you know talking about specific examples what would be direct examples of discrimination I, I, I guess that it's it's a little bit less it's a little bit less gray it's a lot more black and white but that I can't I can't really answer that because it would identify not 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 specific personal examples just in in a in a general sense you know like uh, so direct um, ableism would be things like passing over for promotions um mm. things like not hiring in the first place or if sure. it's um or things like uh i'm trying to, you know when it's like on a when you get a job slip and it's like uh we really admire your skills but <laughs> and, they, and then they say things like oh you can work in this unpaid position even though you are totally qualified for this yeah yeah um i would argue that job advocate uh, the application process is inherently ableist to autistic people with the interviews, um, with the yeah, all the, the the long, lengthy emails and text, and yeah, also the expectation that it's on us to bend to all requirements. So, sure. um, prior to the pandemic, I actually had some uh, employment support, um, but it was always like, oh, you need to do like this really quite degrading, uh, what do you call it, um. They, they would say things like, I needed to practice like a role play exercise in job interviews. Um, Ew. <laughs> rather, than, rather than the sort of like the person interviewing me is legally <laughs> obliged to make reasonable adjustments, it's not for me to sort of go, hmm, I'm going to pretend to be neurotypical for the day and sort of like, you know, hey, how are you type thing. Mm -hmm. That you know, is inherently ableist. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's some you know it's the whole the whole interview process. It's never been. Um, I've never had any difficulties with it, which is which may be surprising. But I, I'm very good at interviews. I feel I feel you know over the years I've I've sort of built my social skills, the, the ability to socialize with neurotypicals quite quite highly. Um, not not in terms of masking, just in terms of understanding what they're trying to say and um, how to put it in words that they understand. And um, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of like a reverse understanding autism. It's it's a bit strange, but um, if you could make that into an app, so we could put it on our phones, that would be so a neurotypical easy. translator. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I was saying to you. It's um I was having to say to my wonderful co-writer recently, they are very obviously a neurotypical person. Yeah. Um Neuro neurotypical sort of syndrome. Like, yeah, and sort of like um <laughs> <laughs> Oh I love that. I'm so borrowing that for whenever I need to say something. Um yeah, cutting to a I know her um intense focus on social interactions. And social standing and and uh, <laughs> things like we can we can make a list of of like you know I, I think I did like a video on that like very far back on my YouTube video is like a a doctor from a world of Asperger's where one percent of the population is neurotypical. <laughs> I, I, got, I got to be a wonderful writer for the first time recently, and it was just so wonderful being able to talk to her and sort of saying. Why is it that we are considered to be the weird ones? Like the mm. sort of like the the in, incessant focus and kind of like always being socially acceptable and conforming and all that sort of thing. Is that not a bit weird? Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's also a disadvan it's disadvantageous because it's, you know, having having a unique personality is quite a drawing, like is quite, captivating for a lot of people i I'd, I'd reckon that a lot of interesting people in the in the 
you know, celebrities and things like that. I reckon that there's quite a lot of them that were on the spectrum or quite a lot of like characters in a movie or a series, like even not explicitly came out and said it, but it they do give me sort of neurodiversity vibes. Mm, it's I'm aware of a few reporters who are in fact on the autistic spectrum. Now, I mm. wouldn't identify them, obviously, but it's sort sure. of like, I like the fact that you say about characters because that is how I think of them. They are the sort of the larger than life type people. <laughs> Do you mind if we if we move on to no, go um, ahead. the next question? Because I think, you know, as we were describing ableism, indirect and direct, we kind of went over why it's difficult to work as as an autistic person in the working world. It's not it's not easy and you have to communicate with people who have a different brain communication style, perception, sense of feeling than yourself. And, you know, just being able to understand yourself and autism is kind of a big step already, but actually understanding how to incorporate yourself into a working world is very difficult. So I guess, you know, what what traits would make or what traits of being autistic do you find um, has helped you in the world of journalism? journalism? I might. Um, <laughs> good question. Um, I'm not sure if it has, to be honest. Um, what, the, the, the thing hyperlexia? That, or... <laughs> that's unofficial. Um, uh, yeah, you don't need it, a diagnosis for it, it. It's, just so, it's just so funny you say this. It's so, when I was... When I was diagnosed back in, when was this? In January 2015, when I finally received my diagnosis for Asperger's syndrome, um, I remember sitting down at the time and sort of thinking, hmm, okay, I know that I'm different, and I know that there will be people who will penalise me for this, mm-hmm. because that is just how the world works. People sure. are <laughs> Um, but I remember sort of thinking, hmm, okay, I know that I can do, I know that I can be obsessional because that, that is the one thing my family would say about me. Just be warned. She can be obsessive. Um, she told you about her special interests, but how was an end type thing? Um, it's thing that, I'd say like that, 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 that sort of intense focus and passion, that's quite a big positive, you know, for me, I mean, it's you've also, you found something that you're passionate about and you can also make money from. It's also um so <laughs> this is sort of like a reverse psychology, I guess. Um I find it very difficult to read people. Um sure. it's um so I can't do faces are blank discs to me. I can't mm. really unless it's like really obvious like happy or sad type thing, I can't really do anything in between. Um sure. What body language is frankly confusing. Um, Just like the the difficulties with with cognitive empathy. Yeah, uh, not empathy, but sort of like the physical. Like, um, it's a what's the phrase? Um, it's I actually went for testing recently, and it turns out I am face blind. Um, <laughs> so no literally, more. I can't tell what your face is saying to me. Um, well, th- I I just just want to. Um, clarify a little bit when i when i say talk about cognitive empathy i'm talking about the um the definition of it which is uh being able to notice and categorize emotions on fr- from other people which is not based on straightforward words so, yeah you know, that in that in, indirect communication <laughs> um yeah <laughs> that i can't really do but the thing about that is so i do remember thinking Hmm, okay, I don't know what faces are saying. However, when it comes to interviews, I can get away with asking the, you know, the sort of the questions that it's socially unacceptable to ask. Um, So I remember, for example, I asked the former editor of The Guardian, Alan Rasperger, would he consider himself to be a feminist? Um, (laughs) um, Which was really interesting. I had heard this interview where it was it was really interesting to me because he said that he was a member of the is it the Garrett or the Garrick Club, which didn't allow Garrick women? Club. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, gentleman's a, club. That was, It was some infamous club in London. I don't know. I've never been. Obviously, I'm female. The, um, the Garrett Club, founded in 1831, is a private members club situated in the heart of London's West End and Theatreland. Yeah, the club provides uh, excellent dining facilities, accommodation, exclusive member events. And <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give them a readout on this. No, yeah. Um but it was uh, I was I just found it super interesting that he had done this interview for the BBC with um I think it was Robert Peston, maybe? Um, where he'd said he may have had a membership at one point, which is why I asked the question, would he consider himself to be a feminist? Um, because media clubs at the time were kind of controversial. Um, not a lot of other reporters kind of, I know think like that, in that they ask the sort of the slightly unorthodox but sort of slightly unacceptable questions. So you have, you have um, quite good um, parallel, what would you call it, parallel thinking? I uh, don't know. Lateral, I lateral just... thinking skills, being oh, able to so connect that dots. it's called? Okay. Connecting dots and stuff like that, yeah. It's I, like I, that. I have this name. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Um, I'm going to remember that. Um, but it was just sort of like, it, it was always that thing about, um, so when I was at school, for example, people hated the fact that I, they, that I would just ask questions. Um, hmm. It's, it's been also quite um, direct. Like... Yeah, and it was one of those things, I'm very aware that I have no filter. So hmm. it's a... It's now people always tell me that I need to like loosen up and tell us exactly what you're thinking. And I'm always trying to tell them, um, this is because I have no filter. So, and it always gets me in trouble. It's not that I'm saying it deliberately. It's because it's sort of like, it just doesn't occur to me sometimes. Well, it's, it's hard, isn't it? Because when people say, I want you to be honest with me, they don't yeah. mean be completely honest with me. I, I just want, the bits that I deem to be acceptable levels of honesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I about a month and a half ago, I actually went um, to a sort of a work meeting that was in a pub, um, and there was another journalist there, and the, because of the fact that they were trying, they basically said, "Be honest," um, yeah. and I and I, the, it's the oldest trick in the book. Don't ever be like fully <laughs> honest because it's going to get you penalised in this neurotypical yeah. society. Yeah. I wouldn't say what I was thinking. They actually turned around and they said something on the line. They said something along the lines of "Go fuck yourself," and um, because I wouldn't answer the question. Oh my god! Yeah, so it's sort of like I'm very aware that I I don't I very rarely say exactly what I'm thinking now just because it gets me in trouble. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think so. it's, it's always good to have some kind of. It's always good to try try and have some kind of filter because I I used to be very 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 like aggressively straightforward, and um, <laughs> as you as you could say, and um, it, I don't know. I'm I'm pretty much the opposite now because I'm just like I just kind of sit sit by and just let people talk and chip in now and again. Um, I also think that listening is a really underrated quality, societally speaking. Mm. It's uh, I kind of think that a lot of autistic people are just very good at listening by proxy of having realised in terms of we need to be like aware of this filter, therefore we will listen mm. a lot more type thing. We also need that 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 input from words because what words are like. Or, or direct communication, whether it be signs, words, etc. Um, it's a lot more comfortable for us than the combination of words with context and emotion yeah. and uh, facial expressions and body language and tonality um, all combine into one neat little package. Um, I, I find it very difficult. <laughs> and I, I also I get myself into to terrible situations with with nasty people because um i take i take their words for their words mm. and i tend to underplay their behaviors so it's like they can tell me one thing maybe do something that doesn't align with that and uh, and I'm, I'm kind of left in this confused 
state is like well, you told me that that was the case or you, you said this to me or you know and um it could be quite harsh sometimes definitely mm. yeah uh, just moving things on a little bit how how do you think we can fight ableism in the workplace or in encourage others we're, we're talking about the you know the things that we've we've identified um, um how do you first, think people can help first of all actually listen and take action rather than just being performative there are so many editors who i've seen i've seen them at diversity conferences and i've seen i've seen this across other industries where leaders are like oh yes we will do better and they don't follow through <laughs> at all um <laughs> Uh, politicians <laughs> yeah pretty much it's just sort of like why would you even bother just because you want some brownie points basically like <laughs> really do you feel better about yourself and just sort of come on um i also kind of feel like strengthening the equality act would do so much good um it's sort of you know when you ask for reasonable adjustments mm-hmm. um there isn't like <laughs> there isn't any sort of an organization can just say no and there's no sort of like fallback. Yeah. Um I would argue the legislation is flawed for this reason. There needs to be some sort of redress. Um rather than sort of like or there are so many organizations that just wait to be basically sued into giving the access arrangements. No. Oh, oh. Um I think it's you know it's 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 weird that isn't it because it's like you know they're, they're trying the the most people within the workforce sort of view autism as a ticket for um representation for diversity yeah. saying we are a diverse organization we take everybody's views and we produce views and things <laughs> related to that and we're so great and so lovely and so wholesome um but really we just want them because we'll get we we'll get the the backhand if we don't yeah. um, offer brownie points, but it's it's really not the case. And there's just there's there's research that proves that having different brains in the workplace is massively important. Like mm. I was just t- talking to you know on my on my first first episode of the season, I was talking to to Temple, and she was talking about um, you know different different ways of of processing, like visually or like language based or like um you know things like that and to put someone who's really good at mathematics um into actually like building a machine is just so much so much worse <laughs> or getting someone who's good at building machines to to, to design complex machinery is you know it's yeah. the different skills and uh, having that difference of opinion and perceiving and understanding things can often offer a lot of, you know, benefit to workplaces. I also think that an intersectional approach needs to be taken. Um, there have been many occasions where I've been hired as the autistic person just to tick a box to say, oh, we've hired an autistic person. I'm very aware that I'm white. I'm very aware sure. that I have a certain amount of privilege. Um, why is it that it's just sort of di- di- if you want to talk about diversity and inclusion, it's not just a one characteristic fits one person type thing. Sure, sure. And it's just sort of it just frankly blows my mind where I see so many organisations where they go, "Oh, we're so diverse. We've hired uh, such and such a disabled person, and we've hired the LGBTQIA person, and then there's like no ethnic minority whatsoever it's just fully white people again Mm -hmm. um very often all male Mm -hmm. if you really want inclusion you need to to be intersectional otherwise it's not inclusive (laughs) i mean when we talk because we're we're talking a lot about the actual workplaces and what they should do and you know you and i both know it's in everybody's best interest to to include people from different you know areas of diversity uh, just for for breadth of opinion and for perspectives and you know things of that nature but how how do we help other people fight fight elbilism in their in their workplace by other people do you mean other not autistic people but other disabled people um i think i think in the context of 
the podcast probably about autism, but um, you can, you you're welcome to touch on other things if you feel it's worth, worth <laughs> touching on. Um, just thinking because I'm only autistic, I don't feel I can comment on other situations. Um, I kind of. I kind of think that autistic people are not the problem. It's the employment. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I love the fact that it, it, there's so much investment in trying to help us into the workplace. Um, and yet we are still the least employed disability group. <laughs> Surely. But like there's, 18, there's no realize. <laughs> like it just sort of, I, I was always made to feel that I was the problem. Um, mm wasn't trying to be difficult as I was often characterised. Um, it was the workplace and the workplace not following through legal obligations. Um, sure. It's also the fact that the sort of like, um, what's the phrase? Um, there is an inherent bias, for example, in hiring practices. There's also, I don't think we're the problem. I think it's industries. I think, you know, one, one thing that I could could say on you know if, if you're an individual person well you're going to be an individual person but if you're listening to our podcast i would really stress getting in some autistic people who are who you could consider to be experts by experience into the workplace to talk about autism in the work uh, talk about the positives talk about some of the negatives and how to to overcome them i think that's usually quite a real you know, really impactful thing from, you know, the train the training that I've done. It's you know, most people, most organisations, they'll get in autism experts who have a background in uh, whatever area related to autism, but they don't actually have the the personal experience of it. And so, yeah. getting in someone who has that can really add to um, sort of the organisation's view of of autistic people and how to work with them best i've never understood that personally and i mean even as a journalist i still don't get it why why do we have this sort of culture of going to like the parent or carer rather than <laughs> the person at the heart yeah. of it like because <laughs> it just sweet. sort of blows my mind really and it's sort of you wouldn't you wouldn't be doing this for any other context so why is it apparently acceptable under the title of disability to do exactly that? It's um, it's that whole thing about, you know, other people speaking for the group. You know, it can be yeah. quite a dangerous thing sometimes. Uh, yep. It can be quite useful um, for like to listen to a parent sometimes if you're a parent yourself and to get their experiences as a parent. But you need to pair that with experiences yeah. of an autistic adult and actually their life and what they found good and bad and you know yeah um in that sort of whole view of, of it i guess yeah exactly well um is, is there anything else that you want to touch on before we move on to the last question or is that no. all good yeah. cool cool uh we may have to make it a bit snappy uh because I've only got until seven because I have this this work peer support okay. group that I'm doing. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about because you've you've recently published a a book um, on cooking and eating, and um, you know it really it really perked perked my ears up because <laughs> I um, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> I love that the perk the ears up that there's something yes, to do I, with food. I like that. But you know, I, I can actually do. I can I can flare my nostrils and perk my ears up. Okay. And, <laughs> um, do a little bunny. Yeah, I don't know. I'm being weird, right? My my weirdness is coming out. Is you can tell it's the end of the day. <laughs> so it perked my ears up when you were saying about cooking and eating. Um, because it's definitely something that I struggle with. I pretty much never cook. I get all my meals pre-made and sent, and I can get all my protein in for the gym and actually eat uh, something other than sweets and chocolate and crisps. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about your book? 
Um, so the Autism Friendly Cookbook is out on November 21st this year. Um, and it basically, in the nicest way possible, it was the ultimate revenge against the DWP um, in terms of having to go to a personal independence payment tribunal, basically. Um, right. They had the... Um, anyone who will have applied will just know the absolute dread of this. So I put in a claim during the first lockdown. Um, it took... I want to say maybe 15 and a half months to actually get to the end of this. And they came back and they basically said that uh, my autism was a lifestyle choice. Um, <sighs> yeah. Um, it just sort of, um, it, it's a Jesus bit that made, nice. Really? That was a life, the, a lifestyle choice. <laughs> that was the summary in the sense of like, um, words to the effect of, um, oh, so, right, okay, yeah, yeah. Right, so the bit that made me laugh most of all was on one of the forms they had, um, there are no communication issues. <laughs> so my, um, I got slightly told off of this, but I had written in the margin to say, this is literally the definition of autism spectrum disorder, if you look it up. Um, they were saying that I could just learn how to cook, for example. I can't just learn I'm autistic. <laughs> Um, and this is so this is despite the fact that I wasn't actually speaking it was actually my mum who was talking on the phone because I find phone calls inherently stressful um sure. I script um I mask and I actually it's after the initial assessment had been done I actually went to sleep for most of the day because I was that stressed um oh my god so but the thing is so when I read the thing about, oh, she can just learn how to cook, um, which I can't just do. I have a spiky profile and all that sort of thing. I was talking to lots of different other autistic people, and there was sort of like, it was really interesting how the sort of like, there was a universal kind of theme. Like, they, everyone had the same issues, and they didn't know what to do, and they didn't know how to adapt, and they didn't know how to learn. Um, it was even things like um, adaptive things for how to cook. So like a jar opener. No one knew about that. No one knew about weighted cutlery or a plate separator. Um, so over the course of about four days, I was sort of talking and I was listening and I was making notes. And I, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, okay, this should be a book. <laughs> like I, I never intended to actually write this. I basically pitched this to Jessica Kingsley Publishers, um, who I'd worked with a, a lot previously, and they basically published like virtually every book about autism that's any good. Um, hmm. So I pitched this. I didn't think it would actually happen, um, but in Christmas 2020, they said, okay, let's do it, um, which was sort of like, oh, okay. Um so there is a hundred recipes set in breakfast, lunch, dinner, and desserts, because me being me, it wouldn't be me without a dessert chapter. Um, 30 of these are from other autistic people. It's got things like, so on the recipe, it will have a key for sensory needs. It has an Ooh. energy rating. Oh. It has a duration. Um, it's illustrated by Emily from 21 and Sensory. Oh, which I love Emily. I'm so excited about this. Um, it's uh, Oh, my God. It's like a collab <laughs> made in heaven. Yeah. it's. I was so excited to bring her on board. Um, she... All her, um, so she's illustrated it. So all the recipes which have the key, they all have a symbol. So if it's adaptable or if it's like, um, got like crunch in it and things, it has her illustrations in the corner yeah. of the recipe. You know, you know um, what, Lydia? Like, I, I really need to get get my hands on this book when it comes out. <laughs> yeah. It would help help me so much. Um, it's um, I'm I, very excited. I really, I really appreciate you. You, you telling me about this um i feel kind of feel kind of bad that i need to push things things along but we've got yeah. about five minutes so it's um <laughs> it's my my terrible timing i get too into the conversations um but please uh the links will be to to the book and and uh, lydia's work and stuff will be down in the description 
Uh, we do actually have a Instagram question, which has popped up. Maya Kearney, uh, who asks, would you recommend disclosing an, or- an autism diagnosis to your team or boss? Uh, it depends on the context. <laughs> I was just going to um, say. It's, a, it's only because I've had some really terrible bosses, um, and as soon as I've disclosed, they've got worse. Um, yeah, so it, it really depend, it depends, doesn't it? It really depends on the person. Um, I'm sorry, that's not a definitive answer. That's really stupid. Like, it, it's mm. really frustrating when people can't give a yes or a no, but it really depends on the person. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say just be open and be like, you know say to everyone just because some people do react quite badly you know i I think as well if if you are quite confident in self-advocating for yourself and you you sort of yeah you have experience in the working world then maybe it could be something that you that you go for yeah um i'd also say it very heavily depends on the industry that you're in so Mm. maybe if you disclose to uh, if you're working, I don't know, uh, what do you call it? Car, car retail, stuff like that. Probably not the best idea. Um, yeah. But if you're working in like a media place or a charity or like, you know, any, anywhere where there's there's um, yeah, a bit more sort of trait openness, as you would say, then it might be quite, it might be quite useful. But I, I'd recommend kind of going to some some autism organizations or some, you know, looking up some local places in your area and asking about support with this because um, it often it often can be really really important. You know, not only disclosing getting a reasonable adjustments, but having like a work coach or a mentor or someone who um, can fight fight for your corner. That's really important as well. Yeah, it's it's hard, isn't it? Like you can't, you can't really give any direct instructions because, yeah. like, if you say it and then they they go ahead and disclose, then they've lost the job and it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, that's I must confess that's why I don't like people. It's I very um, you know that thing where people go, oh, you're an autistic person. I want advice about autism um, because I'm also <laughs> an autistic person. I. It's. I find that quite difficult, just because it's mm. sort of like, hmm. I don't want to get you fired, but I want to be nice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I get. I get what you mean. That's that's our question. Thank you very much, Maya. Really appreciate it. Getting on it so speedily. Um, we have one last thing, which is song of the day. Um, have you have you remembered your your song? Yes. Um, um, I would like to know if anyone listening to this does this. Um, it's I'm told that I have um, audio stints. Mm, me too. Like, it, like you know, when you play a song on repeat yeah. just because it's so nice. Yeah. I, um, I They're the same with this parrot that goes bacon, 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 bacon. Yeah, it's the sound. It's, a, it's a, the writer Laura James um, actually so the, wrote. the up and down. It's like. Yeah. <laughs> It's the writer Laura James had the word hat, for example, saying hat, 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 all over and over. Um, so I chose this. Um, it's not entirely related, um, sort of. I really like, I've been listening to a lot of kind of like early 2000, 2001 music um, recently. I don't know why. I really enjoyed, um, this is, it's called Objection, the Afro-Punk mix by Shakira that was on her 20th anniversary of Laundry Service. Just because uh, this is an audio stim and I really like listening to this over and over. Lovely. I really like that. I will definitely take that into consider it. Um, well, I'll add it to this this Spotify playlist that I'm putting together of everyone's suggestions. I will definitely listen to it after once I finish this work meeting. <laughs> um so if you have enjoyed this episode and you want to um see it on anywhere else i am actually starting to do video interviews this one is a video interview as well and you can view it over on my youtube channel but i also have other stuff over on instagram i do quite frequent blog write-ups as well as sharing reels things of that nature and if you want to get in contact to be on the podcast um, or you want to, to share something with me, or you want to get me in for some training or modeling or public speaking, things of that nature, 
uh, go over to my website, thomashenley.co.uk. Thank you very much to all my Patreon supporters, as well as my YouTube members. And anyone who follows my work, always really appreciate it, always really helps me out. And um, yeah, I think that's my spiel, um, as you would say. Have you enjoyed your experience, Lydia? I have. I'm just so sorry that um, I'm sick. This would have been, it would have sounded much nicer for anyone listening. It was, a, it was a really great interview. I, I really you. appreciated you coming on. Thank you for having me. See you later, um, folks. Do I just don't click off. You? No, don't click off. Okay. <laughs> I always do that. I never, I never pre-warn people, but we need to leave it like a few seconds before it. <laughs>